Yeah. Welcome back, everyone. Four Feathers Press, your editor, yours truly, Don Kingfisher Campbell, is happy to continue the series for the four in one books. This is episode three. Hey, hey. That's right, there's two books. And each book is called Four in One because it contains four poets. And this book one got some guy named Don Kingfisher Campbell. And Linda Crate will be coming on soon, along with Bruce McRae. And today we have Alicia Vigater Spetters with us today to share some of her poetry. And remember that uh, these books are available both by going to fourfeatherspress.blogspot.com and even better, go to the poets themselves. They've got a few copies. You can buy directly from the poet as well. Either way, there's proof right there. All right, so let's get into it. I'm going to bring up the screen share and then Alicia can say whatever she wants. You know, be, before we, we start, I want to thank you for inviting me. And I also want to thank you for uh, introducing me to poetry in Los Angeles. Um, as you know, when I came to the United States with my American husband, I only have two sentences in English. Wow. One was, my name is Mr. Green. And the other one was, I was born in a little town not far from here, which obviously didn't help me. So I never imagined that I would be writing in English. So when I put something together and I sent it to you some years ago, and I was the winner for the San Gabriel Valley Poetry Festival. So you were the first publisher of my first chapbook, uh, Holding a Hummingbird. And that was really a boost. and. Uh, you know, I was very grateful about that. So I just wanted you to know. Thank you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm a big fan, but I'll get into that with the poems. I'm going to slide way down to you because yeah. you're the fourth poet in the book alphabetically. Yeah. And maybe I can start with uh, um, Not yeah. Too Much Fear. I went a little too far. That's the back cover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. okay, what number is the first poem? Okay. It'll help me find it faster. Uh, three. Three, you got it. Oh, hmm. Going into manual. Oh. Oh. No, wait a minute. Here says three. Okay. No, 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 that's not the one. Sorry. Oh, not this one? It says zero three. This is three. Here I have the descent at number two. So one, go one under. Oh, that's right, because I modified it. I fixed it. Ah. Right? Okay, so this is the one. That's the one. Okay, I, I want to say to that not everything that I write is about personal experiences, but these three poems actually are, which is kind of unusual. And this one is about my husband. He sleeps like a baby, and I don't. And uh, some, and I also think he has apnea. So he denies it. Of course, he's asleep. He doesn't know. But when I cannot sleep, I just watch him sleep. And if he stops breathing, or I think he stops breathing, as I don't hear the sound, then I freak out. So this is what it's about. Nocturnal fear. I listen to the smooth roaring of his breath from one shore to the other side of dreams, consciousness, a gentle rhythm of sloshing water fills the bedroom like music. I panic when it deviates its course, the length of a medium-sized rock. I fear the boat not reaching its destination, getting stuck in the middle of the river, currents frozen, wind paralyzed in mid-air, a suspended cloud adrift from her sisters, gone, dissolved into nothingness. He's not aware, of course, of my anxiety, my watchful eye scanning the surrounding darkness, my attuned ear bent like a leaf in the direction of his green center. I cross my hand over his heart, let it rest until I feel a movement, the soft vibration of the soul inhabiting his chest. That's the first one. Okay, I'm going to react to this. That's easy. Mm 
Now, uh, in case anybody hasn't figured out yet, I'm a big fan of Alicia Vigatter Spatter. She, uh, God, I keep blinking in and out. Oh, well, so well, okay, there, nice. I'll stay back. Stay back. Okay. Uh, I'm a big fan of hers because uh, I really love her poetry for a long time now. And I uh, even put her in my, uh, what do I call it? My immortal top 30. I wrote a poem about my top 30 influences and you're one of them. Because one of the things I like about your poetry, especially, is uh, something I think every poet aspires to, and that's to have every line resonate. And I'll give you a short sampling of that here with Nocturnal Fear. Uh, it's like uh, being attentive in every line. I listen to the smooth roaring of his breath. I mean, that alone is poetry. From one shore to the other side of dreams, okay? Figurative language, right? It's very evocative. Consciousness, a gentle rhythm of sloshing. Water fills the bedroom like music. So it's realistic and surrealistic at the same time. It's very evocative of the feeling. And of course, that's uh, a simile. Water fills the bedroom like music. Uh, I'll try not to read every line, but... Uh, they're just so emotionally rich. I panic when it de devi deviates its course. The length of a medium-sized rock, so in my mind, I'm, you know, I'm measuring it out. So it's very visual. All good poetry is. I fear the boat not reaching its destination, right? So that is, uh, it's got that great combination, right? It's emotional, but at the same time, it's a great visual. It's a great image. And I could go on and on like this with every line. I mean, you could pick a line. Uh, although the th first line of the third stanza, that is pretty much strictly emotional. He's not aware, of course, of my anxiety. But then it gets figurative again, right? It gets visual, my watchful eye scanning the surrounding. You know, it's so vivid. That's what the best poetry does. It's, it's, like, it's almost like you're watching a movie. It's cinematic. And that's what a poem should do. It should be visceral. It should make you feel like it's happening right in front of you. So that's what your poetry does. And uh, then for a finish, that's the most important part of a poem, isn't it? The last part. It says uh, something very pure and imagistic, the soft vibration of the soul inhabiting his chest. That's just gorgeous. They say, leave your best image for last, and you did. That is just that it sums it up. It's extraordinary. Let's see if she can keep this up in another poem. <laughs> What's the next poem? Um, and I'll just go one above because I did I, fix the error. Number one, which is remembering the monastery. Well, one. You see, in the old days, you got a headache. It was a headache. As you get older, it's like, oh my God, I must have a brain, a brain, uh, whatever, tumor. So, if, you know, if you don't hear him breathing, you just kind of, oh my God, you know, you start. Yeah, well, that's the stuff hearing. of poetry it is, right? It, it affects you emotionally, but also it's poetry because uh, it is for you. Yeah. yeah. This one, um, when I was seven years old, I went with my family in an outing. And there was this monastery that we visited, about Tsonghani and blah, blah, blah. So when we got there, I told my parents, oh, I remember this place. And I said, no, you never been here before. He said, no, of course. And I described the place. I talked to some of the brothers and I said, wasn't here the scriptorium here? Wasn't there the, uh, the refractorium where the monks ate, ate? And wasn't, you know, there was a new building. The old one was kind of falling apart. And they agree. But of course, I have been teased by my sisters for ages because they knew I wasn't there, and I no, I could not have been there because it was over a hundred kilometers from the city, and I was seven years old. So, but I knew the place, and this is I knew the place. All right. So remembering the monastery, between the damaged roof and the walnut tree, slightly to the right, I watched Venus appear using a celestial method long discovered by astronomers who register astral details as we, scribes, illuminated manuscripts in the dim light of the scriptorium. Those days were sacred. 
when a robin sitting on the windowsill to preen, to preen his tail caught the brother's attention and they lifted their heads from a smooth, smooth parchment, interrupted grinding lapis for a minute to smile at birds ease to reach heaven. Today, the empty monastery stands silent. Stone walls crumble, beehives destroyed. All bees dying in clusters from pesticides. Is orchard burned years ago. The big sty covered with ivy. Only a single, single walnut tree stands by the wooden door, cracked by sun, which like me, was once new and strong. In those clear mornings, nothing was futile. The bundles we carried were not burdens, but a fair exchange for the gifts received. Silence, blue skies, tolling bells falling like rain in May when it was most needed. The roads leading to the door were infinite and no wind blowing over the hills stopped a pilgrim seeking the solace of an inner contact with Andromeda, Cassiopeia, of their own soul from getting the reward. In another life, eons ago, I must have been one of those monks waiting for the beloved, leaning on the walnut tree, close eyes focused on the heart chakra, counting each breath, which like heartbeats connected to my soul. I remember an eagle resting on that same tree, tried to tell me a secret, but I didn't listen. Wow. Okay, so this just furthers my belief that poems are cinematic. I wanna buy the film rights to this poem, <laughs> but I'm not a filmmaker, oh well. Uh, but I think it'd make a great film, you know, great, if there was someone out there has, the ability to make videos, wow, this would be a good one. Because this one uh, definitely transcends reality, right? That uh, the magic of memory. Um, just, uh, just, you know, the same elements you want to find in every good poem, the fantastic uh, descriptions and the uh, emotional, oh, how do you put it? You know, it's, it's resonance for me. I guess that's the word everyone uses, that it has resonance. Uh, especially what hit me here was in the, in the very end. There it is. And he said, uh, this is just so poetic. I remember an eagle resting on the same tree, tried to tell me a secret, but I didn't listen. Wow. That's magic. Well, I know that for the uh, Native Americans, uh, the eagle is a sacred, uh, not only a sacred bird, but is the messenger. And when you see one, normally the thing is trying to tell you something if you listen. Well, I learned something today then. Yeah. Yeah. If I ever do see one, I always see crows. Listen, yeah. Yeah. What do crows yeah. do, crows? I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, okay. Save that for another time. One more poem. Uh, give me an approximate number. I'll find it. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. title. Okay. Okay, it's one of the last ones. I have 11, the best, which probably is the 12. Okay, that's probably going to be 12 now. At this point, I should tell everybody, you can get this corrected copy. It's a PDF. Oh. Also, by going to fourfeatherspress.blogspot.com and ordering one. Okay. Thank you. And I believe that uh, I gave one to Alicia, too. She has the PDF, so you can ask her for the PDF as well. And of course, paying her would be a great thing. If you pay her $5 for the PDF, that, 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 that would be very nice. You say Alicia. Who, who is Alicia? Ask Alicia, you say. Is it number 12? Yes, yeah, number 12. All okay. Right. <clears throat> so this also is an experience I had many years ago in Afghanistan. And uh, it's something that really touched me. We're in, in this bus. And it was a tremendous difference from Iran, which the buses were air conditioning with TV and restroom in the back and, you know, several uh, inclinations on the seats and go to Afghanistan and the buses have no windows and, you know, total disaster. But people were wonderful. And also the other thing is the experience of seeing these 
guys. It was only another woman in the whole bus. They were all guys. And uh, I didn't believe in anything at that time, but I remember thinking, you know, if God is anywhere, is here with these guys. It was such a beauty, uh, beautiful moment and that silence in there. I don't know, something about it. Anyway, the bus. I couldn't say where the melons came from. They appear on our laps, open like doors, and sweet smelling. Dozens of very nice, not Comanche scouts, but mostly Afghani farmers smile, warming the space within the walls of the glassless windows of a bus from Kandahar to Kabul. They delighted on their cleverness as much as our surprise. Questions in non-existing English were clear to me, and I answer every single one in Spanish. Somehow, every smile, every nod of the head, fashion circles of parchment, harmonic tablas of oneness sprouting from black beards, an American men's jeans, a European woman's cotton blouse, open hands of unknown friends. We rode the same bus to the same destination, their capital, ate the same savory pilaus, theirs, communicated in the universal language of our humanity. When the sun rolled as it slips down below the toothless window, the bus stopped. Dozens of blazing black eyes descended the bus two steps, accompanied by rubber sandals, shalwar kameez, and flowing turbans. Men gather prayer rags out of wind and dust spreading them on the desert sand. They stood up. The sun turned the sky pink. They kneel. The sky turned bright orange, deep red as they prostrated themselves. Stillness entered the open shrine. Like a bird, my breath flew away. Oh yeah. I've said almost all I can say. I can just underline now. Right? Look at that ending. Stillness entered the open shrine like a bird and my breath flew away. Gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. And there were some uh, great descriptions, too. I, I think that's the fifth stanza. It says the toothless window. Yeah. And I think earlier you had the glassless windows, you know, so. Yeah. yeah. Well, and they already... Are they Sorry? put the melons on our lap. Suddenly, we have a melon there open in the middle. That was ready to eat, and you know, <laughs> kind of were taking care of you. I mean, it was yeah. It's yeah. Nice. So it's just so vivid, so meaningful, and uh, I'm happy to hear that you're publishing in many places now. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. I've seen your notices. I've been getting. More, I don't submit a lot because it's such a pain. Everybody has yeah. a different requirement and you have to adjust the bio. And, but it's not bad. Uh, the, the results I'm getting are not bad. I yeah, think that's the way it is. That's the way it is. You know, I think you're uh, going to just be recognized more and more as time goes by. Um, I'm so glad you're part of this series. I mean, you're in the inaugural book, book one. Yeah. That's for a reason. Yeah. I can't even say the reason, can I? Go ahead. Can I? Do I dare? Yeah, go ahead. Or I'll say it. I'll say it. These were my favorite poets in book one from the ones that were submitted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I can't lie. I can't lie. Okay. These poets, these, these are like, they were my first three choices. And then that Campbell guy, you know, because I'm you know, feeding my own ego. But Linda yeah. Crate, Bruce McRae, Alicia Vega, Spare, this book is solid gold just because of them. Yeah. Great, yeah. great was, reading. And yours are good, too. I mean, you have some And book two, too, you know, yeah. they're not shabby. Book two has oh. more variety. I'll tell you that. Book two has such a wide variety. You have the... Sweet poetry of Laura Wall Holloway juxtaposed next to the troubled poetry of Marvin Lewis Dorsey. That's a real juxtapositioning there. You're going to go on a real roller coaster ride with book two. That's for sure. And Jer uh, Jeffrey Michael Jensen, he's the king of the surrealists. He's a fantastic surrealist poet. Uh -huh. And Petruchka Alexeva, 
she's someone who's, you know, she sees the ironies of life. She's that kind of person. She can see the ironies and uh, do it poetically. Well, right, she's getting published I, a lot too, for good reason. Go ahead, Alicia, sorry. I was going to say that, um, you know, having learned uh, English as an adult, I know I have lacunas there that, you know, a native speaker takes for granted. You know, you have to learn later on as you go along. And uh, I used to feel pretty insecure. I don't have, um, and I still don't. There, there's nuances that I may be missing, you know, the vocabulary sometimes, certain things, well, what is that? But on the other hand, you know, I was, you know, I was raised in a bilingual family. Uh, okay, I must say this very quickly, that, you know, a lot of people think that in Spain we speak Spanish, which we do, but that's Castilian. There are other languages. And uh, not only Gallego and Basque and Catalan and Valenciano, there's a lot of other languages that have their own grammar. They have been spoken for centuries. So my yeah. father, so the family spoke Valenciano always. That was his first language. My mother was Castilian. So I always grew up with at least two languages. So even though my hearing is not a refined, I think, I think it helps. And then I study French and I have Latin and Greek, which I hated. That was never very good. But also I helped. Can, I can sum that up. You've got more tools in your toolkit. Yeah. You really do. That's for make your poetry is above and beyond the average. That's for sure. Uh, um, very generous. Very generous. Hey, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I've been a fan for a while, and uh, I'm wishing you greater and greater fame is what I'm doing. But for now, uh, I'm going to extend to you, as I am to all the four and one poets, an invitation. This is a tough invitation. In April, Marvin okay. Lewis Dorsey is putting on a poetry festival in Ninoc, California. Now, okay. where is Ninoc, California? It's right next door to Lancaster, California. That's about 75 miles from Los Angeles. Quite a trek to read poetry, but it's an all day poetry festival going from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Every hour, it's a different uh, group of poets. So it's just a feast of poetry plus marvin promises it'll be a feast food wise too he's got some culinary connections there in in lancaster so it's just going to be a special day it's going to be on april 22nd that's earth day yeah and uh i hope you can make I, I it think, i will not obligate you at this time you know think it over think it over yeah i was going to say that i just talked yesterday to um beverly uh -huh. and i asked her about it yeah. How can we do it? Because I'm definitely not driving over there myself, but maybe we can go with somebody. Yeah. So hopefully we can get some carpool going. That's we'll a great idea. Throw that out. Yeah, that would be very mm -hmm. nice. And I would love to support Marvin as well. Uh, he's, a, he's a good guy. And a good poet. All right. So to sum up, everybody, right. remember. Oh, wow. I even forgot to mention one other thing. I'll, I'll try to do both in one announcement. What? Book one. Book two. Available now. From the poets themselves, or go to porkfeatherspress.blogspot.com in PDF or book form. Hey, what's more? The announcement has gone out. Book three. I'm looking for poets to be in book three. I need four poets because it's four and one. And you send in like 12 pages of poetry, which is, you know, approximately 12 poems, whatever. Some send more, some send less, you know. And, uh, and you can be a part of the Form 1 Series 2 in time to head to Ninoc in April, because those uh, books, Book 3, will be available in March. And the deadline for Book 3 is February 11th. So if you know anyone that is a good poet, that has and been, send in those that poems. Join in the gift. Yeah. All right. Thank you again, Alicia. You we got to sign yeah. off. Okay.